Today I am absolutely stoked to show you guys one of the most unique and fascinating aircraft ever designed, the US Air Force's CV-22 Osprey. It's widely known for having two different modes, taking off like a helicopter before rotating its blades forward and flying through the sky like an airplane. To show you guys the unique capabilities of this platform, I'll be flying with the 20th Special Operations Squadron here at Cannon Air Force Base, where you'll get a first-hand look at what this platform is capable of. Guys, I'll say right now, this is one of the craziest videos I've ever filmed, so make sure to strap in and hang around until the end and get ready for the CV-22 Osprey. My name is Tony Belviso, I'm a pilot for the CV-22 Osprey. Our primary mission is infiltration, exfiltration, and resupply of Special Operations Forces in hostile and denied territory. Part of our mission set is to work hand-in-hand -hand with all Special Operations Forces, uh, specifically the Special Tactics Squadron, which you'll see today, or any other Special Operations Force, to ensure that they are put into hostile or enemy territory at a rapid rate and then uh, extracted appropriately at the end of the night. Our goal today is to take Sam out on the flight, uh, show him all of the capabilities of the aircraft and uh, what we can do. Hey Sam, back over here we've got the CV-22 Osprey. The first thing you'll notice about this is the two massive rotor systems on either side of the aircraft. Uh, right below that you've got our nacelle. Uh, nacelles pretty much allow the aircraft to go from VTOL, which is vertical takeoff and land, to airplane mode. So as a pilot, when are you making that transition? Is it based on a certain speed or altitude or just by feel? A lot of it is by feel now, but it is based off speed and altitude, which our seat engineer will call out to us and then uh, we'll transition out to airplane mode. So over here, Sam, we've got the front of the CV-22. What makes this really unique is the ability to do TAR, which is tilt rotor aerial refueling, allows us to get gas in the air. So this probe comes on out and allows us to uh, refuel via an MC-130, which is a modified AFSOC C-130. Now, after just a few minutes, I realized this was unlike any aircraft I'd ever seen before. Combining a helicopter with an airplane gives the Osprey the ultimate versatility. And as I made my way into the flight deck, I couldn't wait to get a look at how this thing is controlled. Over here we've got our MFDs, which are our multi-function displays. Right here is our flight directorial control panel, which allows us to have autopilot features. And up top are all of our engine controls. Jay, it's pretty spacious, not gonna lie. And I'm looking at this thing right here. I assume this is the device you guys use to make that transition you were talking about? That's correct, Sam. Right where your thumb is at right there is our nacelle control thumb wheel. That allows us to transition out into airplane mode and convert back into helicopter mode. It's all quite impressive. From the nacelles to the tilt rotor aerial refueling, the features the Osprey comes equipped with are pretty extensive. However, you can have all the capabilities in the world, but if you don't have the crew to back them up, they really don't mean much. Which speaking of, let me introduce you to one of the coolest Air Force enlisted jobs you could possibly have. My name is Staff Sergeant Caitlin Larson. I am a flight engineer on CV-22s, and a big portion of my job is here on the tail. We operate the hoist, we facilitate the fast rope, we're an infill exfill platform, and we also man the 50 cal machine gun that is strapped to the ramp, and we're super excited to be able to have Sam shoot it today during our flight. I guess a little spoiler alert, but yeah, I'm gonna have the chance to fire the 50 cal out the back of an Osprey. Wild. But anyways, the last individual I need to introduce you to is from the Special Tactics team. They are some of the most highly elite members of the Air Force, made up of pararescue and combat controllers. I'm a Special Tactics combat controller. We specialize in air ground integration, fire support, and austere environments, and forward deployed environments. We spend about two and a half years in our pipeline. Uh, we specialize in weapons, air traffic control, uh, static gun jumping, military free fall jumping, and diving. I'd say the most enjoyable part of my job is the culture, getting to travel all over the world for work, and uh, jumping on airplanes. So there you have it. From the pilots, to the flight engineers, to the special tactics team, those are the individuals I'll be flying with here in just a bit. Which speaking of, I think it's time we head inside the squadron to get ready for the flight. Sam, welcome to the 20th Special Operations Squadron inside our mission briefing room. What we got for you today, we're gonna to, uh, initially get you in the center seat on the takeoff out of Cannon Air Force Base, and we'll depart out to Maffer. We'll be climbing up to about 10,000 feet for military free fall with the Special Tactics Squadron. We'll make a uh, south to north run in for their uh, free fall. Uh, they'll depart the aircraft. Following that, we're gonna go direct out to tilt rotor air to air refueling, which is with the MC-130. That'll be off to the west. We'll get some gas from the MC-130, return here to HLZ Sierra. We'll land, we'll onload the ground force there. 
We'll then pick up and move them over to Embassy for fast rope iterations. Uh, so you'll see that both from inside and outside the aircraft. Once we're complete with the fast rope, we'll move to the center portion of the range here where there's uh, a lot of live fire targets. We'll get you in the back on the gun there, uh, let you shoot a couple of these live fire targets to see what that looks like. And then uh, once all that's complete, we'll return you back to cannon and uh, ops complete. So now that we know the game plan, it was time to get fitted for my gear. In case you haven't caught on already, I'm pretty notorious for struggling to put on my gear correctly, and for the Osprey, it was no different. Luckily, with the help of the amazing aircrew flight equipment specialists, we were able to get it sorted out. All right, guys, we're all geared up here, about to go on the CV-22. I've got the 56P tactical helmet here, which offers some protection and has built-in comms so I can communicate with the pilots and the crew. Also, I'm wearing the Eagle vest, so allow me to freely move about the cargo area of the helicopter and strap in when I'm shooting the gun. I'm excited, I can't wait. Shout out to the AFE team here who uh, set me all up. Let's go. As I made my way up the ramp and into the flight deck, the rest of the crew was getting the Osprey ready for takeoff. It took about 15 minutes for everyone to get loaded up, but once we received clearance, we started our taxi out to the runway. Now, I forgot to mention that this flight would actually be a two-ship, meaning both us and another Osprey would be flying together. Why is this important? Well, whenever this happens, it usually means I'm able to film some epic air-to-air -air footage. Tower had a 5-1 flight at Delta Intersection. Request takeoff on 104 Delta Intersection. Havoc 5-1, flight 02, Cannon Tower, runway 04 at Delta, wind 360 at 16, gust 27, clear for takeoff, L2 on departure. Clear for takeoff, and we'll be 1,000 AM below. Gears up, lights out, clear to make your station. And just like takes off. <laughs> yeah, we're up and out of there pretty quick. All right, I hope you're ready because first up is military freefall. This would involve five members from the special tactics team jumping from the Osprey at an altitude of 10,000 feet. Ranger confirm uh, havoc is clear in the range. Because there were some clouds in the area, we would be making two passes over the drop zone. The first one would be dry, meaning the jump master and pilots would observe the weather conditions and make sure there was a good hole for the jumpers to go through. Aircraft from Havoc, uh, approximately eight minutes out. Uh, the first pass will be dry. Now, assuming all things checked out, the second pass would be for the actual jump. Now, luckily, after the dry pass, there was an opening big enough for the STS team to jump through, so that meant it was time to start the timer and get ready to go. Hey, how many jumpers are going to be exiting the aircraft on your next pass? Five jumpers on the next pass. It was now up to the jump master to make sure everyone was geared up, in place, and ready to go. Havoc is uh, 10 miles to the south, six minutes out, six minutes. Each member of the team inspected both their parachute and their teammates next to them, confirming everyone was locked in and ready for the jump. One minute, one minute from Havoc. As the Osprey made the final turn over the target area, the pilot gave the clear to drop command, meaning it was officially go time. Havoc 51047, clear to drop. Havoc 51, jumpers away. Five years away, search for shoots. Havoc copy, five, get shoots. So we're trying to get up past this precip here on the left hand side up to where there are kind of uh, more lighter areas up there. Okay. Uh, and then there's some low level areas out there that we're going to go try to hit basically to wait for this to kind of pass through. Okay. Low levels, both my favorite and least favorite part of every flight. My favorite because this is where we get to really put the Osprey to the test, doing steep banks left and right through the canyon. But my least favorite because if there was ever a time to get motion sick, this was it. For that first low portion, I'm going to get real low, Okay. Uh, so you won't be able to see them. And then uh, as we get on top of the Mesa, I'll pop up and let them kind of do some stuff. Luckily, I took my daily dose of Dramamine before the flight, so I was feeling pretty good. As we entered the canyon, the pilots dropped us down real low, to about 150 feet above the ground. At this point, the only thing I could really do was find something to hold on to and strap in.
I then decided to get up from my seat in the flight deck to head to the back for a different vantage point. We climbed up to a higher altitude so that we could lower the rear ramp and join up with the trail aircraft. Remember when I said earlier that flying in a two-ship formation usually means some epic air-to-air -air footage? Well, here you go. By this point in the flight, we were starting to run low on fuel. Just like we talked about earlier, the Osprey has the ability to do air-to-air -air refueling, and lucky enough, there was an MC-130 in the area for us to link up with. The entire process only took about 10 minutes, and once we were topped off, we started to make our way down to Melrose Range to pick up the special tactics team and begin the fast rope iterations. Now if you remember, the mission of the Osprey is to provide rapid infiltration, exfiltration, and resupply of special operations forces in hostile and denied territory. You saw one method of that earlier during the military freefall, however the more common technique is fast roping, which allows special operators to quickly exit the aircraft in a precise location where the Osprey might not otherwise be able to touch down. After watching a few iterations from inside, I was able to head out on the ground just in time for the flyaways. This is where the Special Tactics team rappels down before the aircraft quickly departs, simulating that rapid infiltration that is so vital to the Osprey mission. Up until this point, I had only heard rumors on what it's like to be standing outside of an Osprey when it lands. In fact, one of the pilots warned me that the rotors produce the same wind force as a Category 2 hurricane. Now, I've been up close to a lot of helicopters, and typically I'm able to handle myself just fine, so I didn't give that much consideration. However, this time around, things were different. Let's just say I completely and utterly underestimated the power of the Osprey. These guys are gonna get smoked. Yeah, they are. I guess you could say I learned my lesson. Luckily, I was able to recover from that traumatic incident and made my way back onto the Osprey just in time for the final portion of the flight. Yep. It's time to fire the 50 cal. Here's how it would work. First, we made our way over to the live fire area of Melrose Range. Out here, it's just miles and miles of open land with dozens of old tanks scattered across the ground that serve as perfect targets. Next, the flight engineer set up the gun to get it sighted, loaded, and ready to fire. This 50 caliber GAU-21 heavy machine gun is capable of firing 1,200 rounds per minute, and after watching the flight engineer test out a few rounds, I quickly realized that it's not as simple as just pulling the trigger. There is quite a bit of skill involved to properly control the gun in the air and accurately deliver rounds on target. As we circled back around and repositioned over the targets, it was now or never. I took my place behind the gun, aimed down the sights, and squeezed the trigger. I'm pretty sure I missed every single round on that first go, but who's counting? Luckily, when it comes to the military, there's always plenty of ammo to go around, and so after the flight engineer got me reloaded and resighted, I was able to give it one more go before we had to head back for landing. Roger, runway 04, wind 030 at 15, and you are clear to transition to Romeo, landing Romeo will be at your own risk, contact ground window. Sam, you got the gear here? Right now? Yep. Pull it back towards you. There you go. Gear's on the way. Sweet. 130, 130 feet, 90 ground. 100 feet, 70 ground. 70 feet. Gear's down, 40 ground. 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.
Well guys, I told you that was going to be crazy. From doing low level flying through the canyon to watching the special tactics team do military free fall to even getting behind that 50 cal myself was incredible. My biggest takeaway is just how professional the team is from the pilots, the special tactics team to the flight engineer. I'm always blown away. Thank you guys for watching, for tuning in. I hope you learned something new and I'll catch you next time.